Thank you, everyone, and welcome to our first Think Tank series for 2023. I'm going to invite Uncle Bernie Singleton up to do the Welcome to Country Festival. Well, hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Bernie Singleton, and and I'll just come here to do a welcome to country for you. You know, standing on the esplanade, as my great-grandfather and his ancestors did for thousands of years before, you would see rainforest mountains backing us to the north, west, and the south, with our submerged sea country out to the continental shelf, which now is known as the Great Barrier Reef. As it was then, it's still now an important gathering place for all communities of far north Queensland, Cape York and the Gulf of Cap Carpentaria. <clears throat> this part of Australia is beautiful and it is forever sacred and our responsibility is to keep it so. With all its very <coughs> irreparable changes, we still hold its spiritual value at our core. To care for this country, we must first care for ourselves, both our physical and mental well-being. It's important that we understand the role that culture plays in our physical care so we can support firstly ourselves, our loved ones and our community. The area we are gathered on today <clears throat> has always been connected to, to culture through thousands of corroborees ceremonies and celebrations. In 1926, my great-grandfather, a great elder of this area, who lived and died on his traditional homeland, led the corroborees on the esplanade time and time again, even reenacting the first landing of settlers to Trinity Inlet. My father was a barren river man. My grandfather was a barren river man. And my great-grandfather was a Barren River man, and they all walked in the waters of Cairns. So on behalf of my ancestors, my elders of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, I would like to welcome you all to Irukandji Saltwater Jabagai country. I would also like to acknowledge the other tribal groups of the area, of the area surrounding Cairns, Yadinji to the south, Koganji over the range at Yaraba, Gugielangi to the north, and Mulleridgi to the west. Everyone now listening, sitting here today, for your own well-being and your family, make the most of your time here by being in the outdoors, barefoot even. Walk on the esplanade, wander at all the birds and bats in the evening, or just sit under a tree. As you know by now, we have thousands and acknowledge and respect the fact that you are in a special part of Australia. My name is Dr. Bernie Singleton, and I leave you with these last words. Welcome to my country. Thank you, Bernie. It's lovely to have you with us this evening, seeing you look so well and bringing all of your knowledge and experience to this conversation. Uh, my name is Kirsty Davis, and for many of you, um, we've worked together before, or you've known me from my time at the Cape York Land Council, where I worked for 23 years before going to work in Lockhart River and coming back as the CEO of the Cape York Institute seven months ago. Many of you this evening would have seen our amazing Jarrigan High School Year 10, 11 and 12 hospitality students. They were joining us um, thanks to Alison Conroy, who's the head of the hospitality team. Our college, Jarrigan College, is located just 30 minutes south of Cairns. And last year we boasted 60 graduates from Year 12. So we were thrilled to have them joining us tonight um, and supporting this event. I'd like to welcome all of our guests that have joined us from across Cape York, uh, the Torres Strait, the state, and also interstate. 
a little bit of housekeeping first before we start. Um, we'll be entering the building, or through, sorry, this room through the back doors today. Uh, the toilets are located just outside the door and to the right. In the event of an emergency, we will all leave through the front door and gather on the other side of the driveway. Our event tonight should finish at about 8.45 p.m. In 2023, Cape York Institute will host four events. Three think tanks, this one, one in May, um, one proposed for September, and we'll finish the year with our inaugural Bananyam oration. The oration will be a key event where we will visit um, events or people that have shaped this region. In Cape York, we have been tackling wicked problems for 30, 30 plus years. Wicked problems are those challenges that face Indigenous people every day. They are the challenges that have no defined solution. They are the evil that can't be solved on their own. They can be addressed by looking at conflict, power, health and livelihood, populations, inequality, and recognising that every wicked problem is the symptom of another. Ultimately, they are the challenges that can only be truly addressed when community voices bring intent, experience, and collectively we build positions, policies, opportunities to address the resistance to that challenge. Working in this space since my early 20s, I had the great honour of knowing many of these old people that line our walls and that are on our screens this evening. They are the giants who came before us and on whose shoulders we can continue to shape the future we want today. 30 years ago, our old people came together united to address the wicked problem threatening land and seas in Cape York. This movement resulted in the establishment of the Cape York Land Council in 1990, and over the next 30 years, it would see Cape York Development Corp, sorry, Balkanu Cape York Development Corporation, Apunapima Cape York Health Council, Cape York Partnerships, Cape York Institute, all formed to address these problems. Annual land and health summits would be attended by ministers, Queensland State Premier Peter Beattie in 1999, Prime Minister John Howard in 2003. They were a space for many voices, including a young Tanya Major in 2003, when she called for Prime Minister at Beagle Camp, Arakoon, to answer the poor outcomes that she saw in her high school class here. Suicide, poor education, poor health and incarceration. Their memory warms my heart and reminds me of the work and responsibility that we carry today to achieve their visions. Our work aims to build individual and family responsibility, to create change, co-design, build opportunities to empower with the goal of capability building. As the CEO of Cape York Institute, I'd like to share with you our vision, outline the work that we're doing and driving and how we work with community voices to build change. The Institute was established in 2004 and since commencement has remained dedicated to influencing Indigenous policy with Indigenous people's perspectives, innovation and agency. Our vision for a greater, more inclusive nation and determined to unravel wicked problems has created debate and reshaped national conversations about us. First Nations people are better positioned to be included and empowered to determine their future. To amplify their voice, we've established a policy team where we look at international best practice and reform that will build empowerment, development and productivity. We know when we work on wicked problems and make progress on these, we often expose issues in other areas. Our commitment can be seen in bold co-designed policy solutions and strategies. These include constitutional recognition, Family Responsibilities Commission, alcohol and other addictions, job guarantee and education. We participate in national debate, sharing our learnings and our success with the aim of creating a ripple effect, knowing that the change seen in Cape York can support First Nations communities across our nation. Through our innovation space, we create the next iteration of work, reshaping and creating new opportunities based on grassroots learnings and local voices determining objectives. Pama Platform was created in the innovation space and is now being considered to scale up and potentially be used across other First Nations communities. 
These voices de designed the Pama Futures reform agenda. The Pama Futures team are building local capability for communities to determine their priorities and bring government to the table, evaluating existing programs and ensuring a commitment to local priorities. Pama Languages is working with the people of Cape York to develop language programs in early years, primary and high school education. We're connecting speech community diaspora through innovative IT platforms and online learning. Our reach extends beyond the Cape York communities to independent private schools in Queensland and families who are relocated to places like Yarraba, Sherberg, Palm Island and Warrabinda. And finally, our leadership offering in 2023 with an alumni of 800 graduates will build programs for everyday leaders within community and across community-led organisations. Looking forward, we are on the cusp of what will be a historic moment in our nation's history. The Uluru Statement from the Heart has led us to this moment where we are now considering a referendum where First Nations people will be recognised in the Australian Constitution and a voice to Parliament will ensure local and regional voices shape national policy. Decisions about us will be informed by us. We have a big year ahead, and tonight I'm so pleased to introduce you to our facilitator, Sean Brennan. Sean is an Associate Professor at the University of New South Wales Faculty of Law and Justice, and a member of the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law. He has worked with a variety of Aboriginal and community organisations, including at Cape York Land Council through the mid-1990s. His teaching, writing and external engagement focus mainly on constitutional law, native title and land rights. He was a member of the pro bono legal team, supporting the regional dialogues and First Nations constitutional convention that culminated in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Sean is a co-author of Black Shield and Williams Australian Constitutional Law and Theory and co-editor of Native Title from Mabo to Akiba, a vehicle for change and empowerment. Sean will introduce our first speaker, Dr. William Isdale, and then Mr. Noel Pearson. William and Sean, sorry, William and Noel will join Sean on stage to discuss their, their thoughts. And as a panel, we encourage participation from the floor during question time as we discuss native title compensation, makarata, and a voice. I'd now like to invite Sean Brennan to join us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bernie, for sharing um, your words about the country and, the, and its people, and um, for your generous welcome to your country. And uh, I thank Kirsty and the Institute for the invitation to participate in tonight's event. Um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters in, in and around the Cairns area, as Bernie referred to, but also all the traditional owners of, of Cape York. Um, I thank them and the members of their previous generations and acknowledge what they did to educate me about people and country and law and politics and acknowledge also their contribution to the history uh, of this country. There are many people here for whom uh, these questions matter deeply in their own lives and in their own families. Uh, a discussion that's oriented to, to the legal and political issues can never really do justice to the depth of feeling that the topic under discussion uh, uh, dispossession and disruption to people's connection um, entails. But it's a reality that grounds this discussion and it's an important part of it. There are also numerous people in the room, no doubt, for whom this is an important part of their professional and or personal lives. And um, the discussion I expect will traverse both general and specific legal questions and larger and smaller questions about the political context as well. An acknowledgement in advance that the discussion may spend time on one of those areas more than it does in the area that most matters to you. But of course, as Kirsty has said, there's an opportunity towards the end for questions to Will and Noel, and that'll help no doubt bring to the surface more of the knowledge and perspectives and interests that are here in the room. 
as Kirsty said, we'll hear presentations of about half an hour each from Will and then Noel before we segue into a more informal discussion and questions from the room. So my first task is to introduce Dr. William Isdale, whose book is uh, a catalyst for tonight's event. It's no ordinary PhD to take on a topic that has such uh, intergenerational impact and importance in Australia. Um, Will's brought what is obviously his sharp legal mind to a large set of issues with a really thorough, methodical approach, a clarity of analysis and argument, and an acknowledgement that what's at stake is not just questions of methodology, but also principles and values. It's therefore uh, no surprise to see a very full CV already, quite early in Will's career. He's a senior research officer at the Australian Law Reform Commission and adjunct fellow at the University of Queensland Law School. Uh, he's been an associate to two judicial officers, one federal, one state, has a master's from a leading UK law school as well as his doctorate from the University of Queensland. That PhD formed the basis of the manuscript that won the Holt Prize from Federation Press in 2021 and has now been published in, that, in uh, this book. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. William Isdale. So for the past 30 years, we've really had determinations about the existence of native title. You might describe this as phase one of the native title system. And you can see here a map of determined native title, which reveals that over 40% of the Australian landmass is now subject to determined native title. Compensation for native title really reflects a move into phase two for the native title system, which asks whether there has been losses of native title and whether there are any entitlements to compensation in respect of that loss. That phase is really only just beginning now, and I expect that it will go for many decades to come. It's not possible to come to any determined view on what overall compensation liabilities may be, because the number, location, and effect of compensable acts is unknown. But it's possible to do a rough back-of-the-envelope calculation. So if you assume that 1% of those determined native title areas are subject to an unsatisfied compensation liability, and if the amount were the same amount per hectare as arrived at in the Timber Creek decisions, then the overall figure would be something like $56 billion. But compensation awards are not assessed on a per hectare basis. The factors influencing an award are context specific. But I think that that back of the envelope calculation gives a rough sense, at least in financial terms, of the potential significance of this topic. But it's obviously much more than a, a topic of financial interest. Um, Compensation for native title is really part of the historical reckoning that was precipitated by the Mabo decision. Now, generally it is governments to whom, uh, whom compensable acts are attributable, who are responsible for grants of uh, interest in lands that have extinguished native title, for example, that are liable to pay compensation awards. But there are some circumstances in which private companies, for example, can be liable. So for example, the New South Wales and Western Australian mining statutes pass on liability to miners in some circumstances. A statutory entitlement to compensation has been in the Native Title Act since its commencement, but it wasn't until 2016 that we had the first judicially reasoned award of compensation that was assessed pursuant to those provisions. Now at the risk of grossly oversimplifying, the Native Title Act provides an entitlement to compensation in broadly two circumstances. First, before the commencement of the Native Title Act, where it was necessary to restore certainty about certain historic dealings in land. So in particular, many acts were rendered invalid due to the operation of the Racial Discrimination Act. The Native Title Act often validated those acts confirmed an extinguishing effect and then provided a statutory entitlement to compensation. It's not all acts that have uh, dispossessed indigenous people back to the colonization of this country 
that will be the subject will be able to get an award of compensation under the Native Title Act, because there may have been many historic dealings in land that were in, that were valid, even though they took comp they took Native Title without the payment of compensation, because, for example, it was before the existence of the Racial Discrimination Act, or because, for example, it was um, before the existence of the Commonwealth Constitution, which has some guarantees of just terms for certain acquisitions of property. So the Native Title Act does not provide complete recompense for all historic injustices that have been done to Native Title holders in Australia. Now, secondly, the Native Title Act also provides an entitlement since its commencement, um, where it authorises the doing of acts that have an effect on Native Title. So the cost of the statutory sanction is the payment of compensation. Those are the two broad circumstances in which the Act provides an entitlement. Now, the provisions that give rise to that entitlement are extraordinarily intricate, but the provisions that govern the assessment are remarkably spare. So the key provision is this one in the middle here, section 51.1, which says that, that there is an entitlement on just terms to compensate the native title holders for any loss, diminution, impairment, or other effect of the Act on their native title rights and interests. The key words there are an entitlement on just terms to compensate. There are some subsequent provisions that apply more particular rules in limited circumstances, but generally the Native Title Act is permissive rather than mandatory as to the approach that is to be taken to the assessment of compensation. It seems that Parliament was broadly uh, happy to leave the working out of the details to the courts. And importantly, there is no time limits on bringing a claim. So in the Timber Creek proceedings that I'll discuss, some of the compensable acts had taken place 37 years before the proceedings in which compensation was ultimately awarded. Now, there are several aspects of native title that make compensating for its loss particularly difficult. One of these is that native title rights are variable and diverse. Where there is a loss of a freehold or a fee simple, it's known what are the rights that that includes then the analysis only needs to be at the, as to the areas of land over which those rights were lost. But in comparison, native title rights can be extremely diverse and they are particular to uh, individual groups. They ultimately have their source in traditional laws and customs. So in native title compensation, we first need to know, well, what were the particular rights and interests under traditional laws and customs that have actually been lost? And then we need to consider the areas in relation to which they've been lost and the other effects that this has caused and so forth. And secondly, native title cannot be bought or sold. That's a challenge because some of the conventional approaches that we apply to the assessment of economic loss for other rights and interests in land look to the market value of those rights or interests. But there is no market for native title. So how do we come up with the economic worth of native title when it's lost? Now, thirdly, it's typically a group or a communal right. So you're not just compensating an individual, but potentially an entire society. That may raise issues such as whether future generations of the group may need to be compensated for. And perhaps most importantly, native title is not some sterile bundle of rights. It is often associated with dreamtime stories, song lines, rights of initiation, other cultural practices. So native title has often been described as having a religious or spiritual character. Speaking mostly for the benefit of a non-Indigenous audience, in his 1968 Boyer Lectures, the esteemed anthropologist Professor William Stanner said that when we took what we call land, we took what to them meant hearth, home, the source and locus of life, and everlastingness of spirit. So, a key theme that occurs, recurs throughout the case law, and which I also try to grapple with in my book, is this tension between the desirability of applying existing legal principles and approaches versus a recognition that native title is, in the respects that I spoke about earlier in particular, sui generis or unique. So should native title be assessed similarly to other rights and interests, an approach of similitude, or does its sui generis or unique character demand that native title be assessed through its own unique or adapted compensation approach? I say that there are good reasons to do with equality, with the rule of law and with respect for precedent for having as your starting point the application of existing principles and approaches. But the law should not close its eyes to injustice. 
This is a, something that Justice, Mar Justice Brennan grappled with in Marbo, where he spoke about the extent to which the law could change when, it, when there was injustice. So he indicated that the common law um, could be adapted where, the, where there would be an injustice, but he spoke about the common law having a skeleton of principle which gives it its shape and internal consistency. And so he indicated that changes to the common law should still be consistent with that skeleton of principle. What I take from this is that generally we should try to compensate native title holders consistently with the skeleton of principle, with existing principles and approaches, but we can adapt that framework where it's necessary to ensure just results for native title holders. Let's now talk a bit more practically about what happened in the Timber Creek cases, which were the first time that we had a judicially reasoned determination of an award. Now, Timber Creek is a, a remote township in the Northern Territory near the border of Western Australia. And in the 1980s and 1990s, the Northern Territory government made a number of grants of interest in land that extinguished non-exclusive native title over about 1.27 square kilometers of land in total. And these were native title rights that were held by the Nogaliwu and Nungali peoples who sought compensation for the loss of the native title and the consequent effects. The first named applicant on behalf of the claim group was Mr. Griffiths, who's pictured in the top right hand corner. And the trial judge was Justice Mansfield, who's pictured below in another native title proceeding. And the court went on country to hear evidence about the effects that this loss had had on the native title holders. This is two different depictions of Timber Creek. On the left is a painting by Mr. Griffiths himself, who was a renowned indigenous artist. Now, I'm not well placed to talk to everything that this painting represents, but notably, in the full federal court, one of the judges um, started asking questions about this painting as if it was a map, and asking where the compensable effects were located. And the counsel for the claim group, Mr. Glacken, said, this is how Mr. Griffiths visualizes his world, and it does not translate easily into a Euro-Western context. The dreaming cannot be nearly bound. On the right-hand side is a more Eurocentric depiction of Timber Creek. And in red, you can see the location of the compensable axe. The colored lines represent sites of particular spiritual significance. So for example, the, the dark purple line on the left here was the so-called Dingo Dreaming Path. And you can see that it intersects a red rectangle that was where there was a construction of some water tanks, and that was a focus of some particular evidence about the harms that this had caused the claim group. An important point to note is that the location of a compensable act and where its effects are experienced, they don't exactly have to be in the, precise, the same location. Perhaps I can illustrate this uh, with an example from Timber Creek itself. So one of the compensable acts in Timber Creek was the construction of a tourist outlook, which let's say was up here. But the tourist outlook overlooked a secret, a site that was used for secret ritual and ceremony. So the effect was, in, was down the hill in location Y. The courts found no problem in including compensation for those effects uh, for that compensable act. And the High Court described this as collateral detrimental effects. So I think this illustrates the point uh, of Mr. Glacken that the dreaming cannot be neatly bound. Aboriginal connection to country is not uh, rigidly confined by cadastral boundaries of plots of land and the like. You do have to take a broader view of things. So how did the courts approach the assessment of compensation for the loss of these very unique rights and interests in land for the first time? Uh, broadly, they did this by reference to three components for economic loss, non-economic loss, and interest. Now, in relation to economic loss, notably, Justice Mansfield rejected the conventional approach to the assessment of economic loss, which was outlined in a case called Spencer and the Commonwealth. Spencer asks, what would hypothetical negotiating parties agree upon for a sale of rights? But Justice Mansfield said, native title can't be bought or sold. And if the claim group were asked, what would they have been willing to accept for a sale of their rights? Their answer would be not at all. So it was entirely artificial to apply that approach. Instead, his honor, said that he would, apl he would imply, apply an, an intuitive reduction that recognized the more limited nature of the rights in this case as against a full freehold title. His honor considered that it was ultimately appropriate to apply a 20% reduction from the full freehold value in this case. In relation to the non-economic loss component, spiritual and religious harms, 
His Honor described this as involving, as, in, as in, having to translate spiritual or religious hurt into compensation. Again, His Honor described this as essentially intuitive. His Honor accepted expert anthropological evidence and evidence from members of the claim group that the claim group had experienced sympathetic shock when their land had been injured, that they continued to experience gut-wrenching pain and deep or primary emotions through to the present day. His Honor considered that $1.3 million was an appropriate amount to reflect this loss. And then thirdly, there was an award of interest. This was because the first economic component was assessed using historic land values. It was necessary to bring that forward into present day dollars. The proceedings were then appealed to the full federal court. And the full federal court rejected an appeal in relation to the non-economic loss and interest components but they accepted the appeal ground in relation to the economic component. So you recall that Justice Mansfield did, took a more sui generis or unique approach to the assessment of compensation. He rejected the conventional approach in Spencer. The full federal court said that you should apply that conventional approach of market value outlined in Spencer. They said it didn't matter that native title can't be bought or sold because the test postulates a hypothetical market. So you just ask, well, what would the parties have agreed upon if it could have been sold? In relation to the non-economic component, their honors described this as involving an intuitive leap that a trial judge would make after hearing all of the relevant evidence. And notably, they discussed the relevance of money in the community or knowledge about what money is worth. That sounds like an abstract concept, but here's one way of making that concrete. They observed that $1,000 is less than people would spend on groceries in a year. But $1 million is about the median price at that time of a, of a house in one of Australia's major capital cities. So they considered that in that context, $1.3 million, which had been awarded for the non-economic loss here, was an appropriate amount to reflect the significant harm that had been experienced. There was then an appeal to the High Court, and all three of those components were in issue. There were interventions from a number of states and from native title representative bodies. This is an actual picture from the High Court proceedings. I think it was the first time that the full court of the High Court had had to sit in Darwin. And as you see, their honors can barely fit on the bench. You can also see the number of barristers that were involved. Uh, you have to remember that literally billions of dollars were riding on the outcome of this decision, on the approach that would be taken. And again, by reference to those three components that I spoke about, the High Court found no error in the assessment of the non-economic and interest components. But they said again that there had been an error in the assessment of the economic loss. You recall that Justice Mansfield said you don't apply the Spencer test of market value. The full federal court said you do apply it. And the high court struck something of a middle ground. They said that you should adapt the Spencer approach. And the adaptation lay in the fact that instead of asking what would be agreed upon for a sale of the rights, you ask what, instead what would be agreed upon for their extinguishment or relinquishment in favor of the crown. In relation to the non-economic loss, their honors likened this to holes punctured in a painting. So if you imagine the global spiritual estate of the claim group as the canvas of the painting, and the holes are the compensable acts that have been punched, in it, punched into it, what I take from this is simply that you have to consider the effect of compensable acts in their broader context. You have to zoom out and take the broader view. And the ultimate touchstone that their honors endorsed for the assessment of this component was what would the Australian community regard as appropriate, fair, or just. In my book, I take issue with the approach that the court took to the assessment of economic loss. But this is not an academic conference, so I don't really want to go into all the details lest I bore you to, to sleep. It is an evening event, after all. But my broad criticism really comes back to what I spoke about earlier, about this tension between applying existing legal principles and approaches versus doing something different because native title is sui generis or unique. The approach that the High Court ultimately adopted is a more sui generis approach to the assessment of compensation. I argue that there were other approaches besides market value that have a firm foundation in the existing law that the court could and should have applied, would have resulted in full compensation for the native title holders, but been more consistent with the skeleton of principle that I spoke about uh, before, that Justice Brennan spoke about in Marbo, as giving our common law its shape and internal consistency. So I'll spare you the details of all that analysis. But I'll say a bit more about the non-economic loss. The courts in Timber Creek 
constantly referred to how this was not a matter of science of math or mathematics, that it involved an intuitive judgment or an intuitive leap or a matter of discretion. Ultimately, I think we are left with an approach that is highly dependent upon the personal proclivities of judges. And courts are clear in other areas that it's not appropriate to assess compensation or damages through intuition. Instead, it should be a process of evaluation. And the difference, I think, is the postulation of relevant principles or factors that could guide the assessment. And the Timber Creek decisions were, in my view, a missed opportunity to outline some of those potential principles or factors that would provide greater certainty to native title parties, but also courts in future cases. Now, I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. So for example, the High Court said that the loss of native title is permanent and intergenerational. And for this reason, future generations can uh, be awarded some compensation to reflect that loss. But the courts didn't say how far into the future you do this, whether you need to apply some sort of discount to reflect the possibility that native title may be diminished or whittled away over time, of what relevance are the demographics of the claim group, for example. Well, secondly, of what relevance are the number of members of a claim group? If non-economic loss includes the subjective harms that have been experienced, then all, things being, all other things being equal, you might think that a group of 1,000 native title members might suffer more compensable harm than a group of 100 for an otherwise similar infraction to their title. These are just the tip of the iceberg of some of the issues or questions that could be raised in relation to the assessment of non-economic loss. In the absence of certainty in this area, I worry, will inhibit the resolution of claims by consent. Now, because of the fact-intensive nature of native title compensation litigation, this is not going to be, litigation is not going to be an efficient means of resolving these claims. It would burn up a lot of resources. Just look at, as Sean Brennan has observed, just look at the thousands of pages of transcript and judgments to arrive at an award of compensation in this case for the loss of only 1.27 square kilometers of land. So if we could get some greater certainty about what can be taken into account, what can't be taken into account, what are the relevant objectives that we're trying to achieve through the, through, through the determination of this component of an award, I hope that we may be able to find a fairer and more efficient means of resolving these compensation claims than litigating them one by one through the courts. I'll now just very briefly talk about two emerging areas of jurisprudence. The first of these relates to the potential relevance of the Commonwealth Constitution's guarantee of just terms for certain acquisitions of property. Now, just terms is relevant potentially in a number of ways. One of these is that there are some provisions that may apply to limit awards of compensation. So there is a provision that is sometimes called the freehold cap, and it may have a constraining effect and mean that native title parties get less than what is fully compensatory for their loss. This was a provision that was introduced after the 1998 amendments following the WIC decision. But if that were to be the case, there is another provision, section 53, that provides a top-up award when necessary to ensure the constitutional validity of the Native Title Act. So if the Commonwealth Constitution's guarantee of just terms applies to native title holders, if there are any circumstances in which an award of compensation is limited and the guarantee applies, native title holders may be able to get an additional award to top up their award and ensure that they are fully compensated. Another, potentially, another way in which this issue is potentially relevant is that some historic acts may be invalid because they fail to provide constitutional just terms. And I mentioned at the start how the Native Title Act validates some past acts to ensure their effectiveness, and in doing so provides us in, uh, when it does that, it provides a statutory entitlement to compensation. I can illustrate this by reference to a claim that has now been filed in the federal court by Dr. Yuna Pingu on behalf of the Gumanj people. Um, this concerns the grant of certain mining rights in the Gove Peninsula in the 1960s. The argument of Dr. Yuna Pingu is that the grant of those mining rights resulted in an acquisition of the native title in the relevant areas that just terms was not provided and was required to be provided under the Commonwealth Constitution. Those acts were therefore invalid. The Native Title Act validated those acts, 
provides a statutory entitlement to compensation that is not subject to any time bar. I appreciate that this is probably getting a little bit technical and difficult, but the Commonwealth Constitution guarantee looms large as a potential future battleground for, for compensation litigation. And in fact, a, a one component of Dr. Unipingu's case was heard in the full federal court last October. And any day now, we're expecting a judgment from the full federal court, which may shed some further light on these issues and perhaps map out further the potential relevance of this guarantee. Finally, I'd just like to briefly talk about the potential relevance of the general law. In Marbo itself, Justice Brennan said that native title could be protected by such legal or equitable remedies as are appropriate to the particular rights or interests in issue. But in Western Australia and Ward, it was observed that, it was, that, that what this meant was uh, yet to be developed by further judicial case law. So apart from Timber Creek, there are no cases in which native title groups have sued uh, or sued successfully for the common law torts of trespass to land or nuisance to land. Now, how might these be relevant? Well, as I noted at the start, the Native Title Act only provides compensation for native title in limited circumstances. Where there are acts that are not authorized by the Native Title Act that have an effect on native title or their use, the use and enjoyment of native title rights, the act is silent on the question of compensation. So to, to, to seek redress for those acts, native title holders may have to go to the general law. Now, there are two torts that may be particularly relevant, the tort of trespass and the tort of nuisance. Trespass protects against direct interferences with rights, particularly exclusive rights. And nuisance protects against indirect interferences with the use and enjoyment of rights in relation to land. So for example, if you had an exclusive native title and someone drove their truck all over your land, or you had a non-exclusive native title to engage in ceremony, and someone intentionally blasted music and interfered with your ability to conduct that ceremony. What's your redress? I say that your redress is through these causes of action of general law that would entitle the native title holders to sue. And they could, they could potentially uh, achieve a range of different remedies, such as damages, a monetary award that is compensatory to reflect the losses that have been occasioned, or an injunction, which is an order that might prevent those acts from taking place, or to restrain an anticipated um, infringement of the native title rights. So just one more example that might of a nuisance and how that might be relevant is, for example, imagine that there's a native title group that have a non-exclusive right to fish in a stream. And then there's a mineral smelting plant next door that releases toxic, toxic fumes that acidify the water of the stream and kill the fish. That may be an indirect interference with the native title holder's ability to use and enjoy their rights and interests in relation to land that could be sued on by using the tort of nuisance. That area of law is yet to be developed. Uh, in Timber Creek itself, there was a claim for trespass and the trial judge gave an award of damages, but it was overturned by the full federal court on the basis that the, that the issues involved were novel and complex. They remain for further determination. In its annual report for 2016 and 17, the federal court said that it expected a significant number of compensation claims when the legal processes in the Timber Creek uh, proceedings were concluded. The Timber Creek proceedings have now been finished for coming up on four years back in 2019. And it would be fair to say that there have not been a tsunami of claims that have been filed in the federal court since then. There have been about 15. But, as I said, native title compensation is not subject to a time bar. And that might mean that there's not a strong incentive to bring these claims, claims quickly. And no doubt there's also a lot of work that needs to be done in, all, in order to prepare a compensation application. Now, native title compensation is likely to be a significant liability for many states and territories in this country. And it may give rise to political controversy. I'd be interested to hear in particular Noel's thoughts on this dimension later. But, for example, during the term of the Howard government, it was indicated that the Commonwealth would pay for 75% of compensation liabilities incurred by the states or territories. That was reflected for many years in Commonwealth budgetary papers, which noted a contingent liability for those, for those amounts. But in more recent years, that contingent liability, reference to that contingent liability has been removed, and the Commonwealth seems to have walked back that promise. 
when the Northern Territory tapped the Commonwealth on the shoulder following the Timber Creek proceedings to uh, seek 75% of the cost of those proceedings, it was rebuffed. Now, this might be a question that we get into later, uh, but native title compensation is arguably, it may be subject to some legislative restrictions. So for example, the Commonwealth could introduce a time bar, uh, a time limit for when these proceedings could be brought. Or in more practical terms, it could simply reduce the amount of funding that it provides to native title representative bodies to bring these proceedings. Such limitations would only compound the harms that the native title holders have experienced through the loss of their rights. And it's factors such as that that lead me to think that, that this practical consideration of justice is another reason to favour the application of existing principles and approaches to the assessment of compensation. Because through the application of those existing principles and approaches, native title compensation should be regarded as uncontroversial as the payment of compensation for the loss of any other right or interest in land. And applying existing principles and approaches is the surest way to be able to provide a strong response to any allegations of special treatment. I want to talk about the political implications for compensation for native title. Um, we've got to think very carefully about the implications of Timber Creek and this whole issue for the future of um, not just the native title system, but the question of the Makarata and treaty making in Queensland and across the country. I've long been thinking about the necessity perhaps of one that, of attacking the validity that gives rise to compensation um, under the Native Title Act. Because I would have thought there might be a constitutional requirement that the provisions that confirm the validation of title and the entitlement to compensation should afford ready availability of the compensation to the people who are owed the compensation. Because it's three decades later and not many <coughs> compensation payments have been made out to people whose titles have been validated in 1993. So I have speculated in the past to Sean and David and others <coughs> about the possibility of uh, um, agitating the question of whether the compensation provisions of the Native Title Act um, are constitutionally valid. Because how could it be that uh, non-Indigenous Australia get their certainty on day one after the passage of the Native Title Act and the people whose title um, has been impaired and lost have to wait decades for their entitlement to just terms under the Constitution. It seems to me there's a duty on the part of the Parliament to construct a, a mechanism for determining compensation that is somehow um, uh, at least as um, that enables native title holders to, who've lost their rights, to the same kind of security and certainty that um, other parties who take the benefit of the validation provisions of the Native Title Act. So three decades later, not many determinations, or Timber Creek being the the most important so far. And the likelihood that this Timber Creek may not be the first and only case where the cost of prosecuting the case is more than the compensation you receive. Um, how could that be a, a, a just um, fulfillment of the requirements of the Constitution? if the, the process 
of determining the hunts, the the compensation is as is possibly more expensive than the determinations made by the court. It's a big issue for us. Um, and of course, it is open to us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to agitate the question with the parliament, to establish a compensation determination mechanism that is just and efficient and does not see um, native title holders have to, having to outlay great expense and uncertainty um, to receive their constitutional entitlement. The other issue that concerns me is that in Queensland, at least, there is a suggestion that perhaps the entitlement to compensation could be the basis for treaty negotiations with Aboriginal groups. And of course, that is a, a very alarming prospect that government would see an entitlement that, ex that exists um, under the Native Title Act and under the Constitution um, be the basis for some kind of capital settlement with groups. It's like using our money to settle an agreement. Um, and I think that there is some considerable danger that native title groups uh, are set up in a way by the state to make deals, um, settlement deals on compensation, essentially using the native title holders' entitlement as the basis for the deal. You can get your compensation if you settle a treaty agreement with us. That is, um, that is something that I think native title holders and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities throughout Queensland need to be um, very careful about in, in considering um, uh, any kind of treaty settlement process uh, with the state of Queensland. We, we, we must understand the Native Title Act is already a, uh, you know, it's a, a vested entitlement at law that really should be on our side of the ledger. And any treaty negotiations about compensation or capital should be treated as a separate question. We, um, I am concerned that uh, the state will, um, will uh, entice traditional owner groups across the state into settlement negotiations that essentially utilises their money um, as the terms of settlement. Um, you can get your compensation settled if, if um, if you, if you s settle all of our liabilities. Um, on the other hand, however, ultimately, um, there is the question of whether an alternative compensation determination system is the outcome, could be the outcome of negotiations with state and commonwealth governments and a more efficient and more certain and more advantageous mechanism for settling claims is established by agreement with uh, Aboriginal landowners and their representative organisations. The Uluru Statement from the Heart, of course, proposed that there be a voice to parliament established in the constitution and that Commonwealth legislation would um, articulate the structure of that voice. We're heading towards a referendum uh, in the second half of this year. The debate obviously is very much underway um, and uh, the question of its relationship with a treaty was 
considered very carefully and deliberately and over a long period of time that leading up to the Uluru Statement and uh, the logic that came out of the dialogues that were convened over the country was that, well, first we need a voice. We need a representative structure. If we're going to sit down to treaty negotiations with government, we first need a structure to do that. We will, we will need to do it if we ever move to Makarata negotiations. And that was why the, the sequence was always that there be a voice that is then in a position to treat with the parliament um, about uh, unfinished business. I envisage that a Makarata would eventually uh, follow the, the voice and that um, legislation establishing a, a Makarata process um, would, would be the next um, phase of the Uluru Statement. The Albanese government has committed to the full implementation of the Uluru Statement, including the Makarata. My general thinking about the Makarata is that it would be a, a chapter, a, a series of chapters on all of the well-known issues that have been canvassed that might be the subject of treaty negotiations. Not the least um, jobs. We would have a ch chapter, at least from our point of view, we, we would want an agreement about jobs for our people. We would want an agreement about um, our languages. We would want an agreement about our cultural heritage. We would want an agreement about education and health and jurisdiction in our communities and justice and land. The perfection of our land rights would be the subject of Makarata negotiations. And of course, out of all of the chapters of a future Makarata, one of the crucial ones will be the question of a capital settlement with our people so that we, we secure um, some kind of parity with other Australians in terms of our economic participation. How do we achieve economic parity with other Australians in the long term? And what are the commitments that um, we require from the parliament and government of the day to close the gap on economic um, disparity. Now, compensation for native title is therefore one way in which it, it is relevant to the capital entitlement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But this issue of the, the, the fact that this is a vested this is a vested entitlement. We already have this entitlement under the Constitution and under the Native Title Act. It is on our side of the ledger. And uh, one of the things that very much um, annoys me is the fact that Australians don't understand that governments and the rest of the country got their certainty overnight. When the Native Title Act was passed, the rest of Australia got everything secured. They got all of their interests and rights and entitlements secured under law. There was no more uncertainty in relation to their assets and their titles. And yet, with respect to in the indigenous holders of rights and interests, they've been subject to the uncertainty of the claims process under the Native Title Act, and of course in relation to compensation, this very long three decade wait for, for payment. And uh, so the, the, the relative injustice that um, 
that uh, our people have in, endured and still endure um, is not understood by um, most non-Indigenous people. Governments, the legal profession, business, and the wider community are, are oblivious to the, to the fact that uh, the Native Title System and the Native Title Act gave the white fellas everything up front and left the black fellas to three decades of claims and unpaid compensation for native title. Um, so that is the context we're in now. Um, I believe that that uh, the, the, the issue of economic capital and economic disparity and closing the gap on that is the agenda. It has to be the, an agenda for the future. Um, we, we've got to have a real serious approach to how do we close the gap on wealth and economic opportunity and participation for our people. Um, that is what we have to treat with governments about. Um, and native title is part of that. But we should be careful, as I said at the beginning, we should be careful that governments don't use that, don't use the compensation provisions of the Native Title Act as the basis for settlement. Um, I really think that our prospects for the voice are still good. There's going to be um, a, a lot of argument over every I and every T that's crossed in relation to the constitutional provision. The fact is that the provision has essentially been um, uh, you know, carefully considered by two former High Court Chief Justices. Uh, and, and of course, um, former High Court Judge Ken Hayne is, uh, is um, dismissed the concerns raised by Greg Craven and others that there is um, uh, there are all these terrible things that will come as a result of the uncertainty in relation to the voice's role in advising in advising government. The voice provision is very elegant, and and. It, the power of the voice will come from its, from its democratic, salutary voice. That's where the power is. And uh, the, no one should fear that. People should understand that um, hearing indigenous people in relation to their, the policies and laws that affect them will be a good thing for the country and will empower our people uh, in a situation of long-standing and gross disempowerment. Um, I'm hoping that the, the uh, people of Queensland can be enjoined to join the vote. Queensland and Western Australia are our challenges. Um, they're, they're states that are critical to a, to a referendum. And we have, our, we have a very large job ahead of us over the next six to eight months in ensuring that the, there's greater understanding and support in the state of Queensland for the voice. We need a majority of voters in a majority of the states. Um, we, we think that um, the numbers are good. The numbers are still good. They're, they're numbers that can get us um, to a successful conclusion. But of course, over the coming months, one of the difficulties, one of the difficulties is <laughs> 
you know, you can't, you, you can't be too strident in your optimism about, and, uh, uh, about the real power of the voice. Because that's, and, and, and it's very hard to, to assure our own people of all the reasons why the voice is, is a very important idea. Um, it, is the, uh, it, is the, it is the best solution considered by all of the dialogues held across the country. The difficulty is that whatever the indigenous um, community needs to hear is not necessarily the thing that the wider public um, wants to hear. So you know, there's a there's a there's a big challenge. Um, people can be as can can people who don't care about the prospects of the campaign can be as unrestrained as they like. Um, whereas um, those of us who've been pursuing the campaign have this great difficulty in in trying to get people to be clear about the advantages of the voice without um, scaring the horses, so to speak. Um, I think that, that um, the campaigns are gearing up down um, now in favour of the voice. Um, but this is a hard country, as we know. Australia is a very hard country. And, um, you know, we have our work cut out and, but at the same time, it, it may be, you know, think about Mabo, how late Mabo was compared to other jurisdictions. You know, America in the 1820s, New Zealand in the 1850s, Malaysia, Africa, native title decisions were made 100, 150 years ago. And Australia waits for 204 years before we get our native title decision. Australia is a very hard country and uh, very, very slow to recognise Indigenous people and their rights. Um, but we have to be hoping that the momentum is with us. Um, I just, the, the big struggle we have, of course, is is how do we explain that without the voice, all of the things that we strive for in the organisation, in this building, and all of the work that we've done for 30 years, is never going to come to fruition without structural change in the relationship with the parliament and the government. We work from the very lowest bottom in our struggle, get people to manage their money, look after their kids, hope for the future of their children, support them in their education. And while we're working from the bottom, we're, we've been trying at the same time to conceive of the big structural changes that are needed in our relationship with government. I'll say one last thing. The Productivity Commission says that they spend, the country spends something like $36 billion per year in the name of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now that's, uh, that's how they account for the money in Canberra, $36 billion. And of course, that is not what is actually spent on Indigenous people. That is what is given to the states and territories and the agencies of the Commonwealth itself in the name of our people. And of course, we get hammered by that number every year because the number keeps rising. Um, why isn't the Aboriginal problem being solved when Commonwealth outlays amount to $36 billion per year? The National Audit Office did an inquiry into that number, and the Auditor General told me, you know, the great part of that money is in criminal justice. 
It pays for courts and policemen and people in custody. And state, state and territory governments are addicted to that money. They build jails out of it. The lion's share, according to the Auditor General, is of that money is spent on the incarceral system. And as long as the states are reliant upon that, they're going to build more jails for our people and more detention centres for our youth. I am of the strong belief that they are addicted to that money, sure as they are addicted to poker machine revenues. There's a structural reason why we're, we're going to struggle to reduce the number of people in the criminal justice system as long as states receive a gigantic sum of money in the name of our people. So now that's a massive structural issue and, and um, th th that requires a structural response and requires a structural voice if it's ever going to turn around. Why is that investment largely directed at the, at the regimes that, that process our people through these systems that end up in jail? Um, so I don't believe that you can, you can reform those structural problems without having a structural voice. Um, and un until we have some voice power, I don't think um, the, the policies that keep our people incarcerated and, and you know, I, I just I, I see the youth, I see what's going on in Alice Springs and I see what goes on in our own communities. The, we are completely wired up. We, we, our people are complete. Our community is completely wired up to a system that is is just the numbers are still going through the roof. We're going to break more than 50% of children in out of home care in Queensland are going to be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. Pretty soon, we're going to be over the line. I think we're 49% or something now. At some point, we're going to be more than 50% of kids in out-of-home care who are Aboriginal. 4% of the population contributing more than 50% of the kids in, in out-of-home care. And so I'm really pleased William's come to talk to us about this crucial question. We need to get our head around both the question of entitlement on the part of native title holders to compensation. I really think the conversation that has to be had is one of what kind of system, what kind of system could we, could possibly um, be established that allowed for um, a more efficient and more just way of working out the art outstanding entitlement and uh, rather than um, uh, uh, one that results in, you know, the claim costing more than the payout. Thank you. I think generally a good place to start a discussion like this is the why question um, and, and I think we both, we heard from both um, we'll know some of some of what they see as the significance um, of this topic in, at, the, at the start of their presentations, but I wanted to give them a bit of an extra opportunity to to, to reinforce their point, perhaps about motivations uh, and and the importance that they that um, they attach to to these issues. So, I might start with you first, Will, and obviously you don't casually take on a PhD, let alone one on a topic in native toilet law is complicated and important as this. So you must have had your reasons and I just wondered if um, you could tell us maybe why did this issue of native title compensation matter to you a few years back enough to, to want to do all this work? Sure. On it. Thank you, Sean. 
Well, originally it started as a master's degree because I didn't think that I was quite up to, to writing the PhD on the topic. And as I got into it, I discovered that there was just so much here to talk about and that I was enjoying it so much that I turned it into the PhD. I guess I first became interested in native title generally at university. I mentioned that I read Noel's collection of essays up from the mission in my first year of law school. I studied native title as an elective subject at the University of Queensland. But probably most influential upon me was that my first job after university was working for Graham Neat, who for about 15 years was the president of the National Native Title Tribunal. And Graham is the consummate gentleman and was a, a wonderful man to work for, took on a real mentoring role. And while I was working for him, that was the year that Justice Mansfield's first instance decision in Timber Creek came out. And at that time, I was casting around for a master's thesis topic. And just in conversation with Graham, he impressed upon me the significance of that decision. I then read it and, and I was blown away by the, the number of issues that were raised for the first time. It seemed to be the perfect territory for a PhD thesis in which you could say something new. For com in comparison, if you were to do a thesis on contract law, you'd be trying to find a subject matter that was about this narrative in order to be able to say something new. It was comparatively easy, I think, and I hope to say something reasonably new about native title compensation because no one had, had written all that much about it before. Apart from you, of course, John. <laughs> um, I think, Noel, we heard from you why you thought, you know, it's significant and important for Cape York Institute to be running an event on native title compensation as a first as kicking off this new series this year. I don't know if you wanted to add anything more general. I know it's been an abiding issue and concern of interest to you um, since 1992, perhaps before, when you were a law mm. student, but compensation for dispensation. Was there anything you wanted to add to what you'd said? <clears throat> um, I follow the law at a very large distance nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'll be interested in how native title is approached in future compensation decisions and in the jurisprudence going forward. Because I believe the Native Title Act concept of native title is, has been too conditioned by Section 223 of the Act and that the approach taken by the High Court to two questions is um, misconceived and wrong. One, firstly, that I believe native title has been treated according to its statutory definition rather than the original intention of the parliament was that it is a creature of the common law and that the definition of native title in the Native Title Act was supposed to give effect to the Parliament's intention that the legislation was protecting, providing a mechanism to protect and to determine whatever the common law said native title was. But of course that is not how it played out in the High Court. And um, so you know, remember um, Justice Kirby's, in my view, notorious comment that there was a, the Native Title Act <coughs> effected a transmogrification of the common law title. It, the Native Title was transmogrified by the statute and that Australian jurisprudence on native title is focused on the Native Title Act definition of native title rather than by resort to the common law. And that outcome in Yorta Yorta, is that right? Yes. The outcome in Yorta Yorta was, in fact, the, the outcome that our lawyers argued for, and the Commonwealth's lawyers argued the opposite. <coughs> the, the Commonwealth government lawyers were saying, no, this, 
the definition in the Native Title Act is just a capturing <coughs> of the common law. They have resort to the common law to determine what native title is. And I believe that, that the, the approach taken by our advocates and eventually by the High Court um, has been extremely disadvantageous to us. I think Section 223 is extremely disadvantageous to us in the concept of native title. We would have been better off if Australian native title was defined by common law precedent, not by operation of the <coughs> definition in the Native Title Act. Um, both in terms of proof and in terms of content of native title. I think we've suffered a big disadvantage <coughs> both in terms of the, the proof and the content of title. OK, my second problem um, is with uh, the fact that we've not, therefore, had the, juris the very large jurisprudence in North America come to bear on the meaning of native title. Um, because all of that, you know, Mabo was thick with the North American jurisprudence and the jurisprudence from around the common law world. And then all of a sudden, we don't refer to Delgamuk and we don't refer to the, the big cases in North America that treat native title in a more fuller fashion than we've come to treat it here in Australia. Um, it was Kirby again who basically said, no, don't talk to me about the, the North American jurisprudence. That's, that's not relevant. What is relevant is Section 223 of the Native Title Act. Um, so claims, what is my point? My point is that claims for compensation are about the common law entitlement. They're not claims for the statutory defined, statutorily defined native title of the Native Title Act. So I hope that th that's going to be an issue that we can revisit in, in terms of the, the concept of native title that, that uh, is to be compensated. Because um, I believe the Canadian law is far superior in terms of the concept of native title than the one that has evolved in Australia. But it's evolved in Australia because of the statutory definition. Um, it, if, if the statutory definition hadn't been, and hadn't been misapplied in Yorta Yorta by the High Court, um, then I think we would have had a much more fuller definition of native title that would have had to take into account the Canadian decisions about the dimensions of a communal title. And, and that, that, I think, has implications for its compensation when it's lost. Um, there's a famous passage in the decision, High Court's decision in Marbay number two where two judges, um, Chief Justice Mason and Justice McHugh, said essentially that most of the two centuries of dispossession um, by grants to land uh, to other people over native title country was not legally wrongful and therefore didn't attract compensation at common law, and that they had assembled agreement between four judges uh, for that in favour of that view, as opposed to three who had a different view, that that is a different view that said compensation may well be available at common law for native title extinguishment in some way. Um, and that four included a member of the minority in Marbo, the dissenting judge, Justice Dawson, who rejected the recognition of native title altogether. So I was interested with what you, about what you said about that in the book, Will. I wanted to come to you in a moment to give you a chance to 
talk about that a little bit and how convincing you find it, where do you think it might, you know, might be the practical implications of revisiting that. Um, uh, Noel, first, if I, c I, I don't think um, you've ever seen that sidelining of a more comprehensive legal approach to compensation as particularly um, convincing in the Marbo decision. I suppose one question I'd ask you is how unmovable do you think something like that looks, seems in 2023? Um, the court had to do a deal, yeah, in Marbo, um, in order f in order for the win to happen, and and I think the the deal had to be to just dismiss the entitlement to compensation um, with, without any reasoning on the part of the majority, um, simply to get um, the, the deal done on, on, um, on Mabo. Um, I, I, it is such the exclusion of compensation by the majority um, Mason and McHugh joined Brennan and Dawson, yeah, um, just just simply to to get a a majority on the finding of native title. I don't think I think the issue can and should be um, you know should be the subject of a new agitation um, because the grounds for the majority deal on that question uh, are, are non-existent. They, they didn't refer to any um, authority and they made, they set out no reasoning for the position they, they arrived at. Um, but I, I assume that the, the Yirkalik, the Kumaj case, might might return to that question about the compensability of for for extinguishment of a native title um, at common law. You, you you expect that? Well, the Gumaj case in the Northern Territory, I think, is going to be an argument that it falls under the Native Title Act. The view that was expressed in Mabo was not related to the Native Title Act's compensation regime. The view expressed of Dean and Gordon was that Crown Acts that were without legislative foundation were wrongful and would sound in damages, essentially compensation. But the majority just boldly asserted that that wouldn't be the case. And as Noel said, they didn't explain why that would be the case. And in my book, I tried to consider some of the arguments that might be raised if this, if this were to be more substantively litigated. This compensation issue did not really arise fully in argument in Mabo. I think it was just a bit of a throwaway comment of the court in relation to this issue. It was not necessary to decide. It was not fully argued by the parties. And so I think that it is open for re-agitation, as Noel said. Um, and there's two judges who I mentioned, Dean and Gordon, who favoured the opposite view. Um, and I, they, they also, it must be said, didn't fully explain their basis of their view. But I go through the case law and explain um, why I think their view is the preferable one that's open on the case law, uh, which is that Crown Acts that are not valid, valid because of a legislative underpinning are arguably tortious, and that's why they use that phrase of wrongful, because it's an interference with vested property rights without legislative foundation. Mm. Um, well, you talk quite a, a, a lot in the book, but also tonight a little bit about the non-economic loss, and um, and you're a bit critical, I think, in the in the book of of the court not offering more guidance out of this first um, you know real test case on the legal issues. I suppose I was wondering as I read that um, how courts you know, play a role in our in a resolution of big questions for our society and what can we reasonably expect for them and from them and 
whether there's arguments uh, both for guidance but also for caution, and there seems mm -hmm. to me like there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. um, in a first case, on such a improbably difficult question, um, putting a monetary price on dispossession seems such a invidious exercise in many ways. But um, but it felt to the court to do it in that point. And I suppose uh, I was interested in your own thoughts about whether there are arguments for caution as well as for guidance in an early case of that kind. There certainly are. That's a, a good point. One of the benefits, I think, of the common law system is that the law develops and evolves incrementally and slowly. And courts typically just need to decide the case that's before them. They don't seek to legislate for all circumstances or scenarios. If they tried to do so, they would risk um, making errors or mistakes because they'd not heard argument from the parties about all the potential implications. So there are good reasons to go slow and not try to lay down for all time the most conclusive set of guidance on non-economic loss. But at the same time, the court was required in this case to reach an award. And so I think it was within, it was genuinely an, an issue in dispute, the basis on which they would resolve this claim. And simply saying that it was a matter of intuition, I think is not sufficient. The court had the opportunity, if not to lay down the law permanently for all time, seek to crystallize it uh, perfectly, to at least outline some of the uh, principles or factors that guided them in this particular case and that may be relevant in future cases. Um, and courts, ultimately one role of the High Court is to provide that guidance to courts in the future. But, but yes, there is this, this tension between trying to be clear about um, the circumstances before the court, provide guidance to future courts, while not trying to cover the field and, and uh, determine the answer for scenarios that have not been properly argued or considered. Mm. Now, you were talking earlier about the, the proof and content of native title issues and the, the evolution, the kind of somewhat symbiotic evolution of what Australian law arrived at through a combination of what section a section of an act said and what the judges at the time thought they read in those words. And you're contrasting that with, a, I guess, a purer common law approach that might have happened and what it might have been informed, how it might have been differently informed, um, influences from North America and so on. So there's something similar going on with compensation, perhaps, in a sense. At least the question of who is best placed to resolve these questions uh, assisted by who and you, you foreshadowed for example in your talk that it's certainly conceivable Australia could come up with a better system than it has right now three decades down the track for compensating native title holders for lost native title so I just wondered if the, if the compensation issue caught, triggered any thoughts for you about the role judges can play with it, your perception of the role that the judges did play in Timber Creek and how they arrived at their conclusions on non-economic loss, for example, and a determination made by the trial judge that stayed in place essentially all through three layers, although they revisited quite a bit on the economic loss front. My concern is the problems that have evolved in the Australian law on native title were the result of advocacy on the part of native title holders. We got the bad result we argued for. We thought that relying on the statutory definition of native title would lower the burden of proof compared to the common law. I, I was involved. I, I knew the barristers who prepared and argued the case. And I said that relying on section 223 is contrary to our intention in 1993. Um, you read McHugh's judgment in Yorta Yorta. McHugh argues the correct approach um, because he says when he reads the parliamentary debates, he says this was supposed to be a matter for the common law, not for the statutory definition. And um, 
And I, McHugh's judgment is the correct view of what the intention of the Native Title Act was. But our advocates thought that, oh, the statutory definition is actually a lower bar than the common law in establishing Native Title. And I think it ended up being a higher bar. Um, I think the, the, the law is, as it's played out in Australia, has established a higher bar than relying on the common law would have, would have delivered for us. But that was the risk we took in the litigation um, in those cases. Um, so going forward, I, I think the crucial thing is going to be how haphazard and willy-nilly cases are pushed to appeal. Um, the, if there's no strategic approach, we will end up establishing precedents that are not, that present a view of native title that is, is not as fulsome as I think it deserves, but you know, we, we didn't. You would have to say over the last 30 years, we have we have not had a strategic approach to prosecuting appeal cases. It's basically, you know, every enthusiastic lawyer um, that that wants to push an appeal has had their way, and there's been no strength central coordination of the litigation and there's been no kind of strategic um, supervision by Aboriginal advocates and leaders about which cases should have been pushed forward and which cases maybe should not have. I hope that it, this new phase of compensation claims doesn't repeat the mistakes we made, um, I think, um, you know, that led to that terrible Yorta Yorta decision and, um, and, and the, the decisions that followed that. Okay, um, there's a roving <coughs> mic. Is there someone in the room who would like to ask a question? Can I ask a question? You've all said about compensation for Falls Creek. Now, is Falls Creek an Indigenous community or is it a mainstream community? Because, I mean, if it's Indigenous people, whether it's an Indigenous community, now, they're all going to be native title holders. So how are you going to claim compensation against other native title holders? Timber Creek was a township that was mostly comprised of indigenous, indigenous community. The, it was the government that was responsible for certain compensable acts, like the building of infrastructure and the like, that meant that the native title group in the township uh, had an extinguishment of their native title in certain areas. So the, the community was seeking compensation for those acts of the government in and around the town of Timber Creek. Does that answer the question? William, I thought your presentation was great, like very interesting. Um, but one of the things you were talking about, I think it was nuisance and where um, somebody's, people's native title is frustrated in not being able to conduct that. So one of the things that I think of straight away is a lot of the pastoral leases on Cape York where there's non-exclusive native title, native title coexists with the pastoral lease holders, but native title holders are frustrated in being able to access the leases, to be able to fish, hunt and everything on those areas, even when native title's determined. Do you think that is something that may ultimately be compensable? Without reaching any determined views, <laughs> yeah. I would just say that nuisance protects against the unreasonable interferences of others with the use and enjoyment of the native title rights. 
So much would depend upon how the pastoral leaseholder were exercising their rights and whether it was unreasonably interfering with the native title holders' use and enjoyment of their rights. So because there's this concurrent, these concurrent rights or interests in the same land, that raises particular difficulties. So we are all required to put up with some um, vicissitudes of, of life from other people's use and enjoyment of their life. It's not every neighbor's blaring of music that enables someone to sue a nuisance. It's only an unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of our rights. So I, I guess that's a long way of saying that much would depend upon the particular factual circumstances and, and uh, in what way were this, the native title group frustrated in the use and enjoyment of their rights? Was it because the pastoral leaseholder was being unreasonable? Hopefully that answers the question. Happy to chat further afterwards. Thanks for that question. Do we have another one? David? Uh, good day. Thank you both for your um, very informative comments tonight. Um, really interesting to hear. Uh, I had a question about information asymmetry, that finding out whether there's a right to claim compensation is often in the database or the archive of government. Uh, on the way through a native title claim, often people, well, claim groups will identify some compensable acts, but um, only on the basis of what's, cla what's claimable at the time the claim goes in. All of those things that happened before the claim went in that mean it's now not claimable, Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islanders would never find out. Um, how do we balance the ledger? I think there's a legal procedure but a policy issue as well. How do we make sure the information gets out of the archive into the hands of Indigenous claimants? Well, I think you've raised a very good practical point that shows an inadequacy of the existing litigation system. Um, it would seem, and David, I think you'd be better answered to this than me, but there, are, um, there is an ability for potential claimants to go to a court and get orders that would require disclosure of such information. But that's, again, resource intensive to have to seek for, you know, not even knowing about the potential entitlement to compensation, to then have to go and dig up this trove of documents to find out what the nature of the claim may be and its extent. It just shows the inadequacy of the existing litigation system and the desirability of moving to some sort of alternative resolution process. No, Sean, do you have any further thoughts? That sounds right to me. Um, we have another question here. Um, Tony Denholder, Ashurst, and a question for Dr Isdale. I've been wanting to say that publicly. Um, so will over 300 um, native title groups can have an entitlement to native title, so have an entitlement to compensation. Um, as you've said tonight, probably two thirds of the compensation in Timber Creek was the um, non-economic component, the pain and suffering. My, my concern is whilst claims aren't being lodged, how do we, or how do those communities best preserve the evidence of that pain and suffering over, say, the last 50 years as you know, people, sadly, you know, do pass on? Thank you, Tony. Well, you're, you're right. I mean, part of the evidence that's going to be perhaps most important in assessing that loss is perhaps the, the evidence of the native title holders who were there at the time of the compensable acts, which may have been many decades ago. That's going to be the most compelling evidence as to the harms that have been experienced as a result of those acts. There may still be evidence from uh, newer generations who continue to experience the harms that are uh, as a result of the earlier compensable acts, but um, it's going to be most compelling if a claim group can present evidence in relation to both the harms upon claim the, the native title holders that, who were there at the time of the compensable acts and subsequent generations who continue to experience effects. So one um, possibility may be the holding of preservation of evidence hearings to gather that evidence while it's available. And claims group, claim groups may want to give consideration to doing that so that they have that evidence there that's available um, for subsequent litigation, which, as Timber Creek shows, can take very many years. Um, and a prerequisite <coughs> for having a compensation application is having a determination of native title at some point in time. So the fact that it's now 30, over 30 years since we've had native title and we're only beginning to see the start of compensation claims proceeding through the courts shows, I think, the significance of, of the point that you just raised. Thanks. This follows on, I suspect, from the last question and comment. Um, it's a difficulty, of course, to protect and preserve evidence, and those of us who work in the rep body system uh, grapple with that 
all the time. There is not a convenient way to ask the court to preserve evidence if there isn't a claim on foot. It occurs to me that one way would be to, in effect, have another form of application under Section 61 of the Native Title Act. And that is an application by an individual that their evidence be preserved. And that would permit a formal process to take place so that the evidence of the old people or the ailing people who had the knowledge could be conveniently preserved and used later in the prosecution of a claim. And just on another theme, um, Noel talked about the frust well, I infer the frustrations of 30 years and not much compensation. As a lawyer who's got to advise clients about the adequacy of an offer in an environment where there is huge uncertainty about what compensation might ultimately look like, it is immense risk for me to say to a client, this is a good deal, take it. We can only do that in circumstances where the deal is not in full and final settlement. And in my opinion, it's highly unlikely that we're going to get the state to sit at the table and do a deal on compensation that is not in full and final settlement. And until the jurisprudence is settled, it's dangerous for us lawyers, us rep body lawyers, to be saying to our clients, take it, it's good. Because we might be wrong, we're human. And the carpetbaggers are out there urging people. Your claim's worth $29 billion. I've multiplied the timber creek per hectare by the size of your determination area and it's $29 billion. Who can resist that? <coughs> huge temptation. That's a comment rather than a question, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, my name's Heron Loban. I'm the PLO from GBK, the Torres Strait Land and Sea Council. Um, I sort of have... Uh, so my question is, um, William, you talked about this idea of certainty. And then Mr Pearson kind of said that there was certainty at the start of the Native Title Act, but my sort of take as a Torres Strait Island woman, you know, how, who in whose benefit was that? So I guess sitting back sort of 30 years later, do you think that the Native Title Act is something that we really should be looking to and using in terms of our compensation considerations as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Or should we be concerned about the way that it may, I guess, strangle us in the way that we've seen other claims processes in terms of determinations of native title? So I suppose it's kind of a big question, but I'd be really interested to sort of hear your insights or thoughts from the panel. Thanks. Thank, thank you for the question. It's certainly a, a large one and a difficult one. My view on certainty was not so much about the certainty that Noel spoke about as delivering certainty for non-Indigenous holders about the extent of their rights and, and making that secure while leaving Native title holders uncertain, um, but more about the increased uncertainty about the non-economic component that I think was sort of just mentioned briefly in one of the questions that it's hard to advise clients when the law is such an uncertain state as to whether something's a good deal or not, what they might get for the non-economic loss. So my uh, hope is that we will see some more certainty about the things that courts will take into account or not take into account in determining an award of non-economic loss in the hope that this might enable alternative means of resolving claims other than through the court system, which will take a lot of time and resources. Uh, I think the other part of your question, the only thing I think I could say in relation to that is that um, the Native Title Act 
compensation regime is not a complete means of providing justice for Indigenous people. And this was recognised when it was introduced, when Prime Minister Keating spoke about it being necessary for the Native Title Act to be accompanied by a social justice package. Perhaps the limits of the Native Title Act in that sense are shown in the fact that um, many Indigenous people may live in areas where no Native Title was left to claim. And where there was no Native Title, there may also be no entitlement to compensation under the Native Title Act. So in some sense, that shows that there are many Indigenous groups who have been substantially dispossessed and have no entitlement to compensation under the Native Title Act or otherwise. It's far from a perfect system, and I think it just shows the desirability or the need for other measures of achieving justice as well. I hope, I hope that answers your question, but I'd be very happy to discuss it further afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Do we have, um, Kirst, did you, one more, do you think? Or? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, up the front here. Um, <coughs> mine is probably what was followed on over there, more of a <coughs> statement rather than a question. Um, I'm sitting here and listening to all of this stuff about native title and what if uh, native title is determined and so forth. But I wonder what happens to the dispossessed. Both of my grandparents were stolen. Um, and I have family members that are... Um, marginalised, um, whether it be they live in Cairns, whether they be live in Palm Island or um, Melbourne or Yarrabah, where both my grandparents were taken to. So what happens in those cases where when you uh, apply to be part of an organisation, you have to prove your apical ancestors? But that's basically where it stops, only for your membership to that. But it does nothing for the descendants of um, stolen generations who cannot go back to their homelands for whatever reasons um, and who really don't belong to the communities that they are living in because it's not their country. Thank you. Thanks. Did you want to make any yeah. final comments? Um, <clears throat> that's why a process to deal with unfinished business through treaty negotiations is a distinct separate question from the strict compensation for native title under the Constitution and the Native Title Act. And, and we've got to be very clear about the the distinction, I think, and um, just listening to William's really great address this evening, I think the fundamental question of, you remember his slide about similitude and sui generis, what makes native title similar to every, to the way we treat property? in Australian law, and what is special and distinct, sui generis about native title. I've always just argued, and this is why I believe that the getting the concept of native title right for the purposes of compensation is crucial. And, and, I, and I think the reconciliation of those two things, native title in my argument, is not distinct from in from the fullest property right we know under the law, which is a fee simple. Um, native title, the communal native title, is an allodial fee simple. In other words, it's the largest estate known to the law. It's just that it's not a crown grant. It's allodial. It's native. Um, that makes it, th th that's a similarity with the common law. Um, where it is distinct and sui generis and special 
is the pendant or parasitic rights and interests that are determined by the law and custom of the group. The traditional law and custom allocates rights within the society in unique ways according to the customs of the people. So the external dimension of an uncompromised and unimpaired <coughs> native title is indistinguishable from other titles. It affords the largest possession. It affords possession. What did Mabo say? Possession, occupation, use and enjoyment of the land. In my view, that formula in Mabo is essentially the articulation of a, an allodial fee simple. Where it is unique and distinct, and where it is cultural, and where traditional law and custom is relevant, is in relation to the internal dimension of the title. Anyway, David knows, everybody knows, Sean knows, I've been, I've been making the case for this for, for 30 years to no avail. Um, but I, I think that a proper articulation of the common law on native title would have resulted in that concept of title. The, the title of the Miriam people has those two dimensions. The external dimension, which is a possession, as against the world. A possession as against the world. And, and properly understood, the possession of the Wick people is no different. And the possession of the Yorta Yorta people is no different. And the possession of the Yalanji people is no different. What is sui generis to those titles is the allocation of pendant or parasitic rights and interests within the society. And that is where you have to have reference to traditional laws and customs. The allocation of rights and interests within the is quite different from the system of allocation for the Wick people or the Yalanji people and so on. Anyway, without, without us arriving at a, a proper comprehension of communal native title and, and what it constitutes, we will never get properly compensated for it. Um, I think the the, sui gener the danger of the sui generis nature of native title is that it becomes a, an ephemeral right that has no real substance. Um, that, and they have resort to our traditional laws and customs in order to diminish it. Whereas the, 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 the proper approach as, as has been the case in Canada and elsewhere, the proper approach is that in its external meaning, as against the world, the native, the communal title is the fullest title known to the law. The ridiculous situation is an adverse possessor ends up with a greater title as against the world than we do at the moment. Someone in adverse possession ends up with a with a greater title than, than the native title holder in many instances. And it's because our laws and customs are being relied upon by the jurisprudence to actually articulate a diminished idea of what our communal rights are. And that's the danger that Yorta Yorta led us into. Um, and uh, and, 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 and un, until we get a proper articulation of the concept of native title at common law in Australia, not only, our, not only are our determinations less than full, but compensation for lost title will be less than full. Thank you. Before I hand back to Kirsty, I just wanted to thank everyone for those really interesting questions and comments. They really, I think, enriched the discussion at the end there. And um, as I suggested at the beginning, that they re reveal, brought to the surface some of the real uh, grief and stress experienced by people um, in, a, in what is a very legally rigid 
system as it is today, but also some of the hard-won wisdom uh, coming from the floor too with suggestions of what that imagined better system could include or consist of uh, to, to cut some of the, the barriers out. So thank you very much for, for all that and back to Kirsty. Thank you, Sean. Um, I think we should um, show a round of applause for our speakers this evening. Um, William and Sean, we have a gift um, from Noel and I for you both, you. which we'll pass over when you don't have to climb over chairs. Um, I was given some words by Charmaine Nichols from Nuckman Health, which is our health clinic that looks after the students at Jarragon College, looks after their health and wellbeing. And it gives you a hint of the next topic that we're going to be talking about at think tank number two. I'd like to talk to you about another wicked problem affecting First Nations communities with devastating effects. RHD is a preventable disease, but if it's not diagnosed or treated, it can cause heart failure, disability, and even death. It starts with a sore throat or skin sore caused by strep A bacteria and can permanently damage the heart valves. The burden of rheumatic heart disease continues to grow in Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia and is destroying lives through ongoing injections, surgeries, death and the impacts of these deaths in communities. 9,000 people across Australia have rheumatic heart fever. Of this, 80 to 85 per cent are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, predominantly 5 to 14 year old children. We have an unprecedented opportunity to unite and act now to end rheumatic heart disease with Aboriginal leadership, community demand, collective goodwill, and the evidence base to support work that can eradicate this disease. In May 2023, our second think tank will unpack the horrific statistics of rheumatic heart disease and how we can put an end to this affecting our communities. We've got all of your contact details now. Um, so we'll be coming out to you with the next event. And um, we thank you all for taking the time away from your schedules, from your families, and joining us tonight for this discussion. We'll be sending a sem summary out and video footage of the event. We hope that you'll share it with your communities, with your organisations, and we look forward to having you join us to unpack further thought uh, at our next Think Tank event. Travel safe. Thank you. How is he's, he's, well, he's in good spirits, but I think unfortunately his physical health is not great at the moment. Yeah, but, um, 